Сьогодні форум ТВ в Українському культурному центрі «Олдміл» у Торонто, де буде проходити презентація книги Володимира В'ятровича та Любомира Луцюка «Ворожі архіви». І детальніше ви дізнаєтеся з нашого репортажу. Це є співробота. Володимир Вітрович з Києва і я співпрацювали на цю книжку за понад 15 років. Але закінчили її, вона в лютому цього року вийшла і це ми дуже задоволені, бо, як ви бачите, то є приблизно тисячі сторінку про ОУН і УПА. Що вони робили, де вони були, хто їх підтримав, хто їх пробував розбити і як совєти пробували, але не могли час кінчі їх знищити, чи їхні ідеї. It took us over 15 years to get this book from conception to publication. It started with a phone call. That's the true story. I got a phone call. I was sitting in my home, the phone rang, I picked it up, and a man who identified himself as a senior administrative official in the National Library and Archives of Canada said, Are you Professor Lechuk? And I said, yes, I am. Well, he said, I am so-and-so. I won't share his name. And you'll see why in a moment. And he said, do you know what's happening in the archives in Ukraine? And I said, well, as far as I know, after 1991, the archives were slowly opened. They're becoming more available to scholars. People are doing research in them. He said, yes, that's been true. But there is a new archivist, and she She is a former member of the Communist Party of Ukraine, and she has already begun eliminating people in the archives who were pro-Ukrainian, and she has every intention of shutting down that portion of the archives that relates to the Ukrainian nationalist movement in the 20th century. And, and honestly, my answer was, well, what do you want me to do about it? And he says, You're the kind of guy that probably will do something about it. So, hook, and the fish began. And that's how it started. I came to Toronto, I talked to some friends here, to donors, some patrons, I got on a plane, I went to Kiev, I met Volodymyr Vyatrovich for the first time, it was a cold call, I did not know him up until that point. I said to him, I've prepared a list of 27 questions, which I think are important questions with respect to Who were the Ukrainian nationalists? What did they believe? Who did they fight? How did they get supported? What about the home front? How were they eliminated? What were Soviet counterinsurgency techniques? A whole series of questions. All the kinds of questions that I think any well-read uh, person would be interested in knowing the answers to. And of course, some of these are not only critical issues, but they're controversial issues. Uh, the book uh, really is a collection of documents that goes from the 1929 beginnings of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, the OUN, all the way up to the creation of UPA and UHOVER, so it goes through the whole period. This is what makes it unique. We have included all of the programmatic ideological statements of OUN, of the nationalist movement, let's just call it, from the beginning to the end. So you can see the evolution. We also included lots of documents about that demonstrate that the nationalists fought against the Germans, fought against the Poles in Volin, that the Poles fought against the Ukrainians. We talk about anti-Soviet operations and, of course, the operations of the Soviets as they tried to round up and destroy the nationalist movement. And ultimately, of course, they suppressed the military wing but failed to suppress the ideology of OUN and UPA. So that, to this day, we have the Ukrainians who are fighting for Ukraine against the same enemy in a different century who share many, not all, of the ideals of the nationalist movement of the 20th century. So that's the remarkable thing about what we're seeing. And although, as I say, it took Professor Vyatrovich and me almost 15 years to get this book done, it was a very long uh, project, but we got it done. And as it turns out, it appears at a very tragic but fortuitous time. Mr. Putin announces his special military operation of, against Ukraine in February of 2022, and what does he say? We are 
attacking to destroy the Banderiuchi. That's exactly what he said. He didn't say Nazis. He didn't say nationalists. He said Banderiuchi. Mr. Putin is a Soviet man. His grandfather was a Czechist. His father was in the NKVD, and of course he's a KGB man in the Kremlin today. He's corrupt, he's venal, he's a war criminal, all those things we all know. He's also a man who in his mind thinks that he's actually fighting the Ukrainian nationalists. He thinks that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people, and in fact what Ukrainians are demonstrating today is that Ukrainians never were, aren't now, and never will be Russians. And that again echoes, it's a homing of what the nationalists believed in the 20th century. Point to a time in your life when Ukraine was better known than it is now. It's never been as well understood and known as it is today. The world is interested in Ukraine, or let's say the free world. And the part of the world that isn't free is interested for a different reason, but even they're interested. Now, what is also evident and of considerable interest to those who delve into this volume is just how much the worldview of those men and women who are fighting for Ukraine today in the 20th century were inspired by the ideology, by the words, if you like, and the deeds of the Ukrainian nationalists of the last century. Today, they are waging a struggle against a modern-day variant of the very same foe that the men and the women of Oun and Opa challenged decades ago. Neither Voldemort nor I, and let's be honest here, could have ever predicted just how much contemporary relevance our project, this book, would acquire. Ironically, ironically, because of the geopolitical fantasies of the KGB men and the Kremlin. The meaning and legacy of the nationalist movement is, however, probably the most critical thing. What did these sacrifices, what did this fighting over a period of a decade plus, and in fact the last nationalist uh, battle that we could determine from the archives occurred in 1962. 1962. So the insurgent army wasn't finished militarily until the late 50s, let's say, with a few carry-ons beyond that. So there was a remarkable resilience and a fortitude and self-sacrifice of the men and women who supported the nationalist movement. And we trust Voldemar and I, that this collection that we've now presented to you, uh, many of these documents for the first time published in English, will allow for a more careful and, and, and I think considered reassessment of Ukraine's 20th century nationalist movement. I can't be happy about the war uh, in, against Ukraine and Ukrainians, but the appearance of this book is, is very timely. And it's, it's already, I think the first edition is basically almost sold out now. And it's only been a few months. It's been, uh, it's in Harvard, it's in Stanford, it's in the British Library, it's in the Library of Parliament, it's in the Library of Congress. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States have just gotten ordered a copy. So it, it's, it's going to be informing the next generation and future generations about who the nationalists were, what they fought for, what they believed, and why that still is important today. The Soviets were, of course, during and after their struggle against the nationalist movement, very keen on seizing and studying the papers of the nationalist movement. Well, why? Well, again, we've all heard the old saying when we were children, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Ukrainian nationalists have been called fascists and war criminals and collaborators. You can call them bandits, gangs, all that kind of stuff. We all heard that Soviet propaganda line carried on by the Russian uh, Federation. But that doesn't defeat them. I can call you names, but I, I need a stick. I need a stone to break your bones. And so the Soviets collected OUN and UPA documents because they wanted to learn about the tactics of the OUN, about its ideology, who supported them, where were they based, which villages were on their side, which villagers weren't, what was their leadership, what was its strength, how did they recruit, how did they generate enthusiasm, how could they maintain themselves, where did they go in the winter? Right? So the way you do that is you collect intelligence. So the Soviets went out and indeed beginning in 1944, the NKVD command in, in connection with the struggle against the insurgency wrote this, and I'll just quote the very brief instruction. So this is an NKVD Soviet secret police document and it says, commanders of military formations are strictly ordered to preserve all literature and correspondence issued by UPA and UUN, 
confiscated during the implementation of our operations and to forward these documents for processing to the head of the NKVD directorate. If you buy the book, it's in English, but you can, in the um, notes that we have there, and it's extensively footnoted, there's a 50-page thematic index, you can find the links to the archives in Ukraine where you can see the originals most of which are actually in Russian, not Ukrainian. But to translate this book uh, into Ukrainian now would be a, a great long task and very expensive. We were very, very lucky, very fortunate, uh, Voldemir and I, to have Marta Olinik from Montreal, who I think you know, uh, do the translation. And this was for her also a labor of love. We were you know, struggling with this from uh, <coughs> around 2010, right? So we're at 2023 now because you had to get the documents out of Ukraine before they were shut down, and that's something I did. Then you had to find donors and patrons who would sponsor the translation and a good translator, which we found in Marta, and then organizations like the Ukrainian Canadian Veterans Fund, the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Foundation, the Temerte Foundation, Ukrainica Research Institute, uh, the Ukrainian National Federation Foundation, and others. Uh, I don't want to try to list them all in case I forget someone, but all these different organizations over time supported us. And so bit by bit by bit, we did the translation, then we sent it out for external readers, then we found the press, McGill Queen's University Press. Then we have people like my good friend Professor Magochi help us with the cartography. There are eight full color maps in this book that show where Oun and Opa fought and operated and the main battles and, and, and that sort of thing, plus all sorts of unique photographs. As a result of these KGB efforts, I'll just say KGB efforts, the largest existing repository of documentary evidence, primary source material concerning the Ukrainian underground was actually accumulated and organized chronologically by, and also thematically by subject by the KGB. They have the largest documentary cache, cache of materials about the Ukrainian nationalist movement. It consists now of 242 volumes uh, with tens of thousands more pages than even what I just referenced. It was the KGB, the self-styled Czechists, who worked so very hard, so very, very hard for years, just like Voldemar and I on the other side of the fence, to collect and catalog these materials about the history of the Ukrainian National Liberation Movement. They included in those documents evidence about their concerted efforts to repress the insurgents and how that was done. And they left for us today an archival monument to their bitter foes. I mean, this is how sometimes history doesn't work quite out the way you might think it does. They left us evidence about us. And so when Voldemar and I were thinking about a title for this book, uh, for this trove of primary source material about the nationalist movement, we felt that fittingly it deserved the title Enemy Archives. Who's the enemy? archives. It was the longest project of my life. I'll be honest, it was the one I disliked the most <laughs> because it was like a weight on my shoulders. My father was Oun, my mother was Oun, Opa. I, I had a, a burden to get this book out because all of my life in Canada and the diaspora, you know, what's a Ukrainian? Ukrainians don't exist. Malorose, there is no Ukraine. Oh, you Ukrainians are all fascists and collaborators and war criminals. All those Soviet era lies and propaganda, all the stuff that the Russians have continued to spread and tried to spread even with the beginning of this invasion of Ukraine. It was the background against which we were working. And we got it done. Ha, huh, Slava Bowl. Uh, you know, and I, I remember I got the book first, of course, because I'm in Canada. And I, and I rang up uh, Voldemar in Cave using FaceTime, and it was late February, and he's in his apartment in Cave, air raid sirens in the back, it's cold, it's dark in his apartment, there's no light, he's holding up his cell phone with a little lamp, and he's looking to see the book, and you know, I thought, wow, this is... A that was the most miraculous and happy moment I've ever had in a book launch because, you know, I couldn't be with my colleague. We will hopefully see each other in October in Cave uh, to launch the book there in Cave and Lviv, but it was a great moment. So it's been, you know, as much as I'll complain, um, but this was, this needed to be done. And I'm very grateful to Ukrainica and to UNO and the Shevchenko Foundation 
Tim Rattay Foundation, the Veterans Fund, all of the organizations that understood that regardless of all the other things, and particularly now with the war on, and we want to help the refugees and we want to help the war, uh, the, the, the men who are defending Ukraine, despite all those other distractions, important distractions, priority distractions, people still supported this project. And that was really great, you know, gratifying. Uh, you know, I, I think I have the reputation of the guy in the community who goes around, prosudaite, prosudaite. Um, and they gave, you know, and um, well, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? So it's, uh, it's a big book. It's an expensive book. The people who buy it through Ukrainica or come out to lectures like this get a fairly significant discount. Uh, the National Library of Ukraine wants 100 copies to distribute to libraries across Ukraine, and we're working on that right now. So this project has a life, and it has a value that I don't think even I originally anticipated would, it would have when I started with Voldemir. But we got it done. So when we look at these pictures and we look at these graphics, and here are the ones I think many of you have probably seen these before. These are the sort of famous graphics of Neil Kasevich showing that the old UN and UPA were fighting for freedom of nations, freedom of peoples, were fighting to break down the prison of the USSR to free the, not just the Ukrainians, but if you can look in the, in the windows there, you can see Latvia, Lithuania, and so on all the captive nations should be freed from the Soviet prison of nationalities. And this is what Oon and Opa were fighting for. And the Soviets knew this. They had this information. All of the information in this book was, as I say, captured by the Soviets. So some of it was generated by Oon, some generated by Opa, some generated by the Germans, some generated by the Poles, some generated by the Soviets. And when you look at the whole thing in context, you see that the ideals that the Ukrainian armed forces are fighting for today are very much the same kind of ideals as the men and women of Oun and Opa. They fought, as they said, Slava Ukraini, Slava Hero. Для Форум ТВ з Українського культурного центру Олдміл у Торонто Костянтин Снісар та Лариса Байус.